morning, everyone. My name is Tomasz Wawrzyniak. Uh, I work as an assistant professor at the Department of uh, Polar and Marine Research at the Institute of Geophysics, Polish Academy of Sciences. I coordinate the hydrometeorological monitoring that is conducted at the Polish Polar Station in the north in Svalbard. And I've been visiting Svalbard for the last 15 years, at least uh, once a year. Uh, I was also overwintering at the station. And this is the place where I go quite often. For example, this year I'll I'll go to Svalbard in April, then in June, and then again in September, just to conduct the scientific research within the projects that I work in. Uh, we have plans to drill boreholes in April. Uh, this is the time when there is snow cover and ice cover, so we can uh, go with our drilling rig. That's a machine that drills the boreholes. We can go freely on tundra because the tundra is not hard. It's covered by snow, so there is no trace of our activities. Uh, and we can conduct them only uh, during this time because during summer we would just destroy everything and we don't want to do it. Uh, during summer, uh, I conduct uh, measurements of runoff. That's why I go in June when the melting season starts. This is where we deploy our instruments that measure uh, runoff, also temperature, different meteor stations. Uh, and we also fly drones. Just yesterday, our a brand new article was accepted in the journal Remote Sensing, so it will be published soon. Uh, and going to Svalbard for me, it's always exciting thing. I'm always super happy that I can go there because it's really beautiful place and I'm happy that I can share uh, my pictures within this presentation. And maybe some of you will learn something new uh, about Svalbard because I collected the information that I really wanted to tell you uh, in this presentation. I'll start with the location of Svalbard, then I'll uh, tell you something about the history and the settlements that are in Svalbard. Then I'll show you some examples of wildlife. And then at the end, of course, there will be science and some uh, field trip uh, security uh, issues uh, that I will discuss because, as you can guess, it's not super safe to uh, conduct research in Svalbard. Yeah, when you think about the Arctic, uh, in the heart of the Arctic, in the middle of it, there's the North Pole, and I guess everyone knows it, but not everyone uh, thinks about the Arctic as the Arctic Ocean and its surroundings. That's, Ar uh, that's Arctic Ocean that is covered uh, by floating sea ice, and around it there are those huge continents of North, uh, uh, North America and Eurasia. And there are also islands such as Greenland, and archipelagos, so uh, multiple islands, such as Svalbard. And I'll be talking about Svalbard. I don't know where you are because I see people from different countries, but I conduct this presentation from Warsaw in Poland. And this is usually where I go in straight line. It's 2,771 kilometers to our Polish polar station Hornsund. And people think it's the station uh, at the North Pole. And it's not true because to the North Pole, it's still pretty huge distance of 1,450 kilometers. Uh, Svalbard archipelago consists of islands that are between the latitude 74 to 81 degrees north and between longitude 10 to 35 east. Uh, the biggest island of Svalbard archipelago is Spitsbergen. And sometimes people mix that because they think Spitsbergen is Svalbard, but it's not. It's just the biggest uh, island of this archipelago. Uh, if you think about Svalbard, if you go there uh, on the way by plane, you can see how the landscape looks like. Uh, the land is covered by more than 60% with glaciers. Uh, there are also mountains and valleys and gla glacially eroded fjord systems. The highest mountain is Newton Toppen, uh, 1,717 meters above sea level. So basically, you can expect these landscapes as you can see on the pictures. Uh, this region is uh, highly influenced by oceanic currents. Uh, the western shores uh, are influenced by West Spitsbergen current, which is a branch of the Gulf Stream. This is relatively warm water uh, of temperature around four, uh, plus four to plus five degrees. 
uh, and it influences uh, the temperatures on land as well. Because when you compare the temperatures from the northern Greenland or uh, Arctic Canada, these temperatures will be much lower than in the western coast of Svalbard. So you could be surprised that even during winter that can be thawing. Uh, so yeah, it's just because of this Gulf Stream branch, which is uh, West Pittsburgh and Current. Completely different situation is on the eastern uh, part of Svalbard because it's influenced by East Spitsbergen and Current that brings cold water from Arctic uh, Ocean. So it drifts from the north to the south. Uh, the temperatures on eastern Svalbard are much lower than in western Svalbard. The mean temp uh, annual temperature in Spitsbergen is uh, around minus six degrees. And the warmest is July with its mean temperature plus five degrees. For comparison, average tempor uh, annual temperature in Poland is around plus eight, plus nine degrees. Uh, so it's much colder. In winter and during spring, the mean air temperature is around minus 15 degrees. In the past, the coldest months were December and January, but in the last two decades, it switched into uh, coldest uh, period th that is moved to uh, March and April. So now actually it's much colder in March and April than during winter. Uh, there is also low annual sum of precipitation, which amounts up to 500 millimeters, uh, but in the central part of the island is around 200 millimeters. So it's pretty dry. Uh, usually on the picture, uh, on the pictures, you can see beautiful weather, sunny conditions. And uh, I remember one talk that uh, was between two professors. Uh, one of them was the wife of the other. Uh, and she said, you never told me that the condition, weather conditions are so bad. You always showed me beautiful pictures. I almost didn't take my uh, rain jacket, but you know, for the presentations, you will see beautiful pictures, but you can expect really bad weather in Svalbard. There are those cyclones and anti-cyclones that travel, and you can expect strong winds, uh, blizzards, uh, strong precipitation, uh, because during uh, autumn, it can rain a lot, and during uh, spring, it can re be really snowy. But when Svalbard officially appeared on the maps, actually there are informations uh, given by the Vikings uh, that they reached uh, Svalbard in the past in the 12th century. Uh, they called this Svalbardi Fundin, which meant the frozen coasts. Uh, so we know actually Svalbard was discovered before the official uh, discovery by the Dutch expedition led by William Barents in 1596, but officially Svalbard was uh, found in 1596. Uh, soon after this expedition, this expedition brought the information on wildlife that is there, and there was huge demand for uh, the blubber of whales. Uh, because the blubber was uh, was used to produce oil that was used in lamps. So uh, th in the beginnings, in the 16th and 17th century, uh, just whalers were coming to, to Svalbard to hunt on whales. Uh, and in the beginnings, it was uh, taking the whales into the shore to cut them and to produce uh, uh, from this blubber the oil in huge pots. So this is when the first stations appeared on land in Svalbard. But soon they were super, uh, uh, yeah, they, they just, you know, hunt on so many whales that it was not possible to hunt them near the coast. So they had to travel further and further. Uh, so they uh, put the uh, pots to melt the, uh, the blubber on ships. So in this time, it was not necessary to have this uh, land stations. Uh, so the hunting, the, the whaling moved to the open seas rather uh, than to stay in Svalbard. They were that successful that after those years of intensive hunting, they almost led the whales to the extinction. 
uh, and we can see some remnants on shore. For example, on this picture on the right, you can see the skulls of the whales. But in recent years, what we observe is that uh, whales are coming. Uh, Norwegians also uh, still hunt on the minke whales, but it's very limited. And actually all other whales are safe. So they are coming back and you can observe them uh, in the fjords of Svalbard, for example, this jumping uh, humpback whale uh, and also other whales. These are the pictures I took last year during the cruise. After the whalers, hunters appeared in Svalbard and they were interested in fur. Uh, and actually the fur that uh, polar foxes have uh, during summer is not that beautiful, not that warm. Uh, so they had to stay over winter just to hunt on foxes and polar bears, just to have better fear uh, during this time. Uh, locally, they also hunted reindeers and seals, um, and they were also collecting the uh, dawn of the different species of birds. So it was important to stay throughout the year in Svalbard and these hunters stayed there. Mainly these were hunters from Norway. Uh, in the end of the 19th century, a uh, scientific expedition started to be interested in Svalbard. And during the International Polar Year 1882-1883, the new station was established by Sweden in Kap Torsen. Uh, there was also Swedish-Russian expedition in the end of the 19th century. Uh, they precisely determined the astronomical, uh, using astronomical methods, the latitude and longitude, uh, and they did also a lot of topographic work. And there are some remnants of this Konstantinovka station in uh, Gashamna uh, in Hornsund Fjord. Svalbard was also a great place uh, to try to reach the North Pole. As you know, North Pole is located on the floating sea ice. So once you uh, prepare for such expedition to go there, it's better to start, uh, start on land. And a uh, few expeditions were uh, starting from Svalbard. For example, this one, uh, Andres Arctic Balloon Expedition in 1897. They tried to reach uh, North Pole using hydrogen balloon but they were very uh, unsuccessful and this expedition uh, ended tragically, all of them died. Uh, but the one that is, uh, the, the one that was led by Roald Amundsen in 1926, it was on airship called the Norge and they reached the North Pole, they, they did the overflight uh, on 12th of May, 1926. So, uh, yeah, they, they started in Svalbard. There are still remnants of the mast they used for this aircraft. Uh, then the beginnings of the 20th century, uh, there was this boom of industrial development and all the industrialized countries demanded large amounts of raw materials such as coal uh, to produce energy. So prices of coal were, uh, coal were high, and the mining started in Svalbard because there is coal there. Uh, many countries started to mine. Uh, it was Americans, it was uh, Norwegians, Russians. And actually, they tried to occupy the land where they started mining. And there were you know, discussions how to divide this area uh, that were ongoing during the First World War. And after the war, it was decided that there has to be some agreement. And this is when the Svalbard Treaty was signed in 1920 in Paris. Uh, in Paris. Uh, and until now, more than 46 countries uh, signed this uh, agreement, this Svalbard Treaty. Poland joined in 1931. And this treaty says that uh, there is freedom of scientific, exploratory, and tourist activities. Uh, of all the countries that, uh, that signed the treaty and all the rights are governed by Norway. Uh, there is administrative uh, office 
in uh, Svalbard, in Longyearbyen. This is governor of Svalbard. Uh, that comes from Norway. And whatever we want to measure, whatever we want to uh, deploy, whatever equipment we use, we need to apply for permission to the governor uh, just to inform where and for how long we'll be conducting the measurements. And that's something that applies to everyone. Uh, Norwegians decided that they will try to protect as much of Svalbard as they could. So you can see most of the uh, archipelago is covered by national parks, nature reserves, or geotope protection areas. There are also special places for uh, bird sanctuaries. Uh, so it's very, uh, the, the most part of Svalbard is rather inaccessible. But our station is located in uh, the middle of the South Spitsbergen National Park in Hornsund Fjord. And we conduct our research over there with all the permissions from the governor. Uh, during my presentation, I will show you some settlements that developed in Svalbard. I'll start with Longyearbyen, the uh, Norwegian settlement that has around 2,000 uh, citizens and habitats uh, during the whole year. During summer, it can be almost 4,000 people living there. Uh, there is also Russian uh, town Barentsburg uh, with around 500 people living there throughout the year. Uh, in Alessand, it's uh, international uh, scientific stations, uh, international scientific base with multiple stations from different countries. And in the south, there is this Polish Polar Station, Hornsund, that is used throughout the year. Uh, our continuous expedition uh, stayed there for the whole year. It's just few people. This time, it's just seven of them. Uh, but during spring and summer, more people are coming. I'll be going there, as I mentioned. Uh, there is no roads between the settlements, so uh, once you travel in Svalbard, you have to consider that, that you will have to use some uh, different means of transportation, such as snowmobiles during spring or go on foot during summer. Uh, once you want to reach different locations, you can go by ships. For example, from Longyearbyen to, to Hornsund, there are multiple ways to go, like speedboats, uh, some sailing boats or whatever. So in the past, I used many different ways of transportation. Uh, when we work locally, when we go to different parts of the fjord, uh, we go by rubber boats, uh, such as you can see on the uh, lower uh, upper right side. For tourists, the, uh, there is also possibility in Longyearbyen to go by dock sleds. But as uh, scientists don't use that anymore, it was used in the past just a century ago. Recently, we go on skis or on snowmobiles. Uh, here are some pictures of uh, Longyearbyen. This is where the university is located. It was founded by American 19, in 1906, uh, John Munro Longyear, but it was sold to Norwegians uh, in 1916. Uh, and there is a university, there is hospitals, supermarket, different hotels. And actually I saw, and uh, that's something I've been seeing for last 15 years. It's really developing. There's more and more buildings, more facilities for tourists. Uh, it seems that it's developing just for that reason. It's mainly for tourists who are interested in visiting the Arctic. Uh, all the buildings are set on piles, as you can see on the right side. Uh, these piles are drilled into the permafrost, into frozen ground, just because it's more solid for the construction. Uh, once the ground thaws, so the active layer, it's sort of the layer that appears uh, above permafrost that thaws and freezes through thaws during summer and freezes during winter, it's not stable. That's why these piles have to be drilled deep. And actually, in recent years, we observed degradation of permafrost. So these piles are getting longer just to reach the permafrost itself because the active layer is thicker and thicker. There's thawing that reaches deeper depths. Uh, you can be surprised by the signs.
uh, Agatha. Uh, give me a break, sorry. Agatha? Okay, the host is not here, I guess, or maybe she is. <laughs> because I have different sounds uh, in my uh, speakers, uh, in my headphones. Uh, wh what I wanted to say is you can see these signs on banks, on supermarket, uh, signs that say, do not come with your armory, don't come with your weapons. And normally, you know, everyone knows it, but in Svalbard, it is, uh, you're obliged to use the rifle once you go outside the settlement. It's just because of the polar bears. Polar bears are strictly protected, but you have to defend yourself and uh, rifle is actually sometimes the only solution. Uh, I mentioned also about the Russian settlement of Barentsburg. In the past, uh, we collaborated with uh, Russian scientists. They also conduct meteorological measurements and hydrological measurements. And recently, for no reason, we don't collaborate with them. And I don't think it will be possible anytime soon. Uh, there is also abandoned city of Pyramiden. In Svalbard, it was abandoned in 1998. In the past, it was mining town, and recently there is hotel that is uh, operated uh, by Russians, and it works also throughout the year. And here are some images of Nealesund, this international uh, scientific base with multiple buildings that come from the mining. Uh, past of the town. Uh, the mining uh, was stopped in the 60s, in the 20th century. And after that, it was decided that these buildings can be used by scientists from different countries. And actually, scientists from different countries uh, have their station in those buildings. For example, Italy, Netherlands, China, United Kingdom, France, South Korea, uh, India, Japan, Germany, and of course, Norway. Uh, in the south, as I showed you, there is Polish Polar Station Hornsund. Uh, it was uh, built in 1957. Uh, and uh, then there was the first overwintering expedition in the 50s and 60s and beginning of 70s. It was used only during the summer. But since 1978, uh, there are continuous uh, expeditions that go there for a whole year. Uh, I took part in such expedition in 2011-2012 as a vice leader of the expedition and meteorologist. Uh, and now the new expedition is preparing themselves. They have uh, courses uh, on the avalanche courses, first aid course, uh, shooting course, and also courses to be prepared to conduct different measurements. So they will know what they will have to do there once they are uh, in Hornsund and they will know how to do it uh, safely. These are the surroundings of the stations. The main building is located in the middle of this uh, circle. Uh, there is also warehouse, workshop, and near the shore of Isbjörnhamna, the bay on the right, you can see the hangar for boats. And there is also gas station. Uh, the station is managed by institute that I work in, and actually I'm giving this presentation from the main building uh, of the Institute of Geophysics. Uh, in Warsaw. Uh, so this is where all the expeditions start. We uh, give the uh, commercial or just we advertise that there is possibility. We, we are looking for people to go to Svalbard. We usually we do it in October. Uh, then there are applications that are coming. Uh, then we check all those application, uh, applications and invite people for interviews. Uh, once they are interviewed, uh, the leader is already chosen. So that's the person that uh, also is during those interviews and has to decide together with us who can go and who cannot. Uh, we're looking for specialists, but you know, even the best specialist can be person that shouldn't go to Svalbard because it would it may be hard with such person to live for a year. And you know, it's not families that go there, it's strangers that will stay in small group in such remote place. So it has to be really, we have to be picky when people come and trust me, I've seen many situations uh, and many people during interviews that I wouldn't go for a year and even for a week uh, to such place as Hornsund. So they have to be chosen wisely 
because it's a long time they spent together at the station. Uh, there is multiple uh, monitoring programs that are uh, and the measurements that are conducted at, at the station, for example, meteorology, hydrology, glaciology, seismological monitoring. And that's the thing that is done by the staff of the station. There, can, there has to be also mechanic, uh, IT guy, uh, and, uh, you know, just to, for the whole year, these are persons that conduct the long-term monitoring program uh, and also uh, work for the station to, to, for it to, to work properly, such as mechanics. Uh, and for the summer, there is a bigger group of technicians that come. They do some renovations once it's necessary. Uh, and there are also uh, scientific expeditions that go to our station uh, just to conduct short uh, term research. For example, ornithologists, uh, ornithologists come for summer only because there's no birds during winter or almost no birds because I saw some during uh, my overwintering. Here are some pictures of the laboratories. There is oceanographic laboratory on the left and hydrochemical right, laboratory on the right. So you can see these are pretty convenient uh, laboratories to conduct research. And we usually uh, think about ourselves that we are you know, those first explorers that go to some remote Arctic place. So I think that's pretty funny to think about ourselves like that because at the station, it's very comfy. Uh, you can see on this picture that the mesa room, the main living room, uh, has couches, it's warm inside, but of course, conducting research outside is always going out and doing stuff like uh, our parents think we do. Uh, to survive in the Arctic, all the animals have to adapt to the extreme conditions. Uh, and the greatest challenge is uh, getting food to survive. So those tough animals that stay throughout the year, the mammals such as uh, polar bears, reindeers, or Arctic foxes, they have to hunt uh, and they have to eat something and they are specialized to do that. Uh, there are 19 species of marine mammals that are found in Svalbard. Uh, Five species uh, are uh, seals and 12 are whales. There's also walruses. Uh, and what you can found, find in the surroundings of Svalbard and in Svalbard on land during winter is polar bears, walruses, narwhals, uh, bowhead whales. Yeah, so those you can see even during uh, winter or spring. There are some pictures of the whales and on the left, there is this walrus. And whenever you go to the field and you see some fresh tracks, uh, you are aware that there can be a polar bear in the area. And this is the sign from Longyearbyen that says that, that you can expect polar bears everywhere in Svalbard. So once you get to the field and you see fresh tracks, you really don't want to stay in this place. You really want to go back and go back to safety. Uh, polar bear is the largest of the eight bear species and the largest land dwelling carnivore. And in Svalbard, the population is uh, amounted to around 3000 uh, bears, which is more than people that live in Svalbard throughout the year. Uh, just some comparison of uh, newborn is around half a kilo, but the males and females are huge. Uh, the biggest male recorded was one ton uh, in weight. So yeah, th they are huge. And once you think that they can stand on their paws and they can be uh, three and a half meter tall, you can expect that meeting the bear in the field is not the safest thing to do. Actually, I met polar bears in the field many times and always it was very exciting meeting. I was going back slowly uh, and I was never attacked by a polar bear. Uh, some of my colleagues took, so, took those pictures. You can see the huge male on the left and cups on the right. 
Uh, what we know for sure, the polar bears are very intelligent and very interested in whatever we set in the field. Whatever we leave there, it should be, and it is, uh, weatherproof. But then once, once the polar bear comes, it really tests the equipment, how heavy and how hard it is. So many times, actually, some of our masks were just fallen uh, because we're pushed by polar bears. Also reindeers that scratch their antlers, they also uh, just push our equipment and masks. So this is, you know, has to be repeated uh, setting of the equipment at, at least, uh, sometimes at least few times a week. That's why it's very convenient to have people at the station that go and check if equipment is still working. Mm, here are some pictures of the dogs. Recently, we don't have any dogs at the station. Uh, for me, it's uh, really uh, not good news because I love I love dogs. I have two dogs uh, on my own, but during overwintering, you know, it was just feelings that you can give to dogs and they give back. And also for safety reason, they were informing whenever the polar bear was in the area. Recently, we have monitoring with different cameras, uh, but sometimes it's really hard to spot the bear once the cameras are covered with drops of uh, rain. So maybe hopefully the dogs will appear once again at the station. And actually healthy bears wouldn't attack people, but there are those who are not uh, strong enough to hunt for seals because the main uh, meal for uh, polar bears is seals. Those who are old, uh, sick or too young to hunt well, these are the most dangerous bears for us. Uh, we observed also because of less and less sea ice uh, in the fjords and in the surrounding of Svalbard and in the whole Arctic. In the Arctic, uh, there is less and less sea ice that appears. Its degradation is around 13% per decade. Uh, and sea ice is the place where polar bears hunt. Uh, what was observed was hunting polar bears, hunting on reindeer. And it wouldn't hunt on the reindeer on land because the uh, reindeer would outrun the bear. The bears are fast, but in short distances and uh, reindeers can run for longer distances. But this one was pushed to the fjord and then uh, was hunted by bear. Uh, we can also observe Arctic foxes that are brave and interested in everything, especially in chewing our cables of the equipment. Uh, that's why we always try to avoid leaving open cable in the field. Uh, we put uh, those into uh, steel hoses just to protect from biting. But, you know, it can happen. Uh, we observe also uh, walruses. It's not pretty, uh, pretty safe to go close to walruses, but they are relaxed and once you don't disturb them, uh, I took this picture last year because they were just sleeping, ignoring my uh, me in the uh, just nearby. So yeah, walruses are amazing uh, and are not afraid of humans because yeah, we don't harm them at all. Here you can also see some examples of seals. So that's the main food of polar bears. And during summer there are. You know, the wildlife is dominated by seabirds. There are seagulls, fulmars, ox, uh, terns, skuas, puffins, kittiwakes, geese, guillemots, eiders, sandpipers, and many, many uh, more birds that come uh, during summer in the surrounding of uh, Hornsun Station on the slopes of the nearby mountains. There is a colony of little ox with uh, 500,000, so 1 million. Uh, 500,000 pairs of birds, so 1 million birds, uh, which is a lot, of course, and you can observe them how they fly to, to hunt on the fjords to eat, and to they fly to the Greenland uh, sea just to eat, and they're coming back to their nests uh, on the rocks, as you can see on the right. Uh, one of the very interesting birds is also Arctic tern that comes to the Arctic for summer and for the winter goes to the south, to Antarctica. 
uh, and uh, yeah, because then during our winter in northern hemisphere, there is summer in the southern hemisphere. So the Arctic terns travel from one uh, pole to the other, I would say. There are also ptarmigans that you can see, puffins, and other different uh, species of birds. You could expect, because sometimes you see the pictures of, of the Arctic taken during spring, and you would say it's rather white there because everything is covered with snow. But during summer, it's not true. Uh, there is just short vegetation season that lasts from the, let's say, middle of June till the beginning of August in Svalbard. And then you can see the plant growth and distribution. Uh, you can see many moths. You can see grass, different saxifraga species, and also fungi such as these. These mushrooms uh, are, yeah, not poison, but uh, they are protected, so we don't eat them. Mm -hmm. You can also see uh, flowers there, like Drias octopetala, purple saxifraga. So, you know, Arctic is not white throughout the year. It's blooming during summer, during the short vegetation season. So hopefully you won't expect during summer that everything will be covered with snow because snow stays only in upper parts of the glaciers and also on the highest tops of the highest mountains. Uh, but lower parts, those close to the sea are green uh, with tundra. Uh, Arctic region is highly impacted by the ongoing climate change, and this is very interesting for the scientists, just because there is no direct impact of human activities, it's far from the proximal anthropogenic, anthropogenic impact. Uh, so whatever happens there, we know it's a natural system, and it helps us to understand the impacts and consequences of climate change. For example, functioning of rivers. It's changing with the climate change. We know that the rivers are more active throughout the year uh, because in the past they were active only during melting that was starting in the end of June. And then in September rivers, the, the smallest ones, of course, the, the biggest were uh, freezing later, but the smallest one were frozen in the end of September. Recently, we observed that the rivers start to flow in the beginning of June or end of May. And this flowing uh, lasts till uh, November, sometimes December. So it's because of higher temperatures and because of higher precipitation that comes as rain. So there's more water that flows. So the regime of rivers has completely changed, uh, changed comparing to uh, the regime that we observed in the 80s, 40 years ago. In the recent decades, we also observed the climate change in the conducted monitoring, uh, such as uh, this meteorological monitoring. In this data, we observe, for example, higher temperatures. And these temperatures change from uh, annual average of around minus six degrees to uh, higher than minus two degrees. So this is 4.5 degrees warmer than in the 80s. And this has many uh, impacts on the functioning of glaciers, on permafrost, of course, and its degradation. What we also observe is higher precipitation that comes as rain. The record high was 800 millimeters in 2016. I won't go into details of the uh, monitoring, uh, this hydrometeorological monitoring that I conduct, because there will be some additional lectures in the future. And also I gave some lectures in the past, but yeah, you can expect my lessons on hydrology and climate in Svalbard uh, in uh, upcoming uh, webinars. But I would like to mention here, because I think it's always important to say something about the safety challenges in Svalbard. Uh, and there are multiple challenges that we meet as scientists and also all that go there. And actually, it's something that you compare also to uh, and maybe apply when wherever you go to the mountains in Poland or to the forests in whatever place. It's always important to check the weather forecast because especially in the Arctic, our activities are highly dependent on the changing weather, which can change very rapidly. There is, you know, 
freezing temperatures, it can be windy, there can be low clouds and fog that limit our visibility. Uh, in the fjords, in the lakes, in the rivers that we conduct research, there is also cold water uh, in which without a proper suit, you wouldn't survive longer than just a few minutes. Uh, so we have to be prepared for that. Uh, there are also glacial and slow processes, crevasses on the uh, glaciers. Uh, by slow processes, I mean the mass movement of the slopes or avalanches. Uh, there's no roads, as I said, so wherever you go, it may be very long distance and you won't call taxi to take you back. Uh, and going by snowmobile, you know, you can reach some, some place uh, 60 kilometers further in one hour uh, driving a snowmobile. But then if something happens to the snowmobile, you will be going back on foot and this will take at least a day or longer. Uh, and I showed you some uh, images of wildlife, such as polar bears. Uh, also, foxes can have rabies, so uh, it's not, you know, super fun to, to be nearby those uh, wildlife. And there is also limited communication network. There is no GSM network in the surroundings of Hornsund. There is network uh, in surroundings of Longyear BN, uh, in Eastfjord Radio, other location and also uh, near uh, Barentsburg, but in Hornsund, we uh, can use only VHF radios or satellite phones for communication if we go uh, further. And, you know, in such place as there are some small mistakes, some uh, under-preparated stuff, uh, for example, uncharged battery can lead to severe situation and evacuation from there can, you know, take time or be even impossible. Actually, it's very convenient for us that Norwegians fly uh, their helicopters in different conditions. So in our minds, we have, uh, you know, we just think that it may, we may be survived by someone if something happens. Uh, in the past, one of my colleagues fell into the crevasse, very deep, 26 meters. Uh, his colleague that was on, uh, on the glacier still didn't fall into the crevasse, he informed the station. The station informed the governor of Svalbard and they sent the helicopter informing that there will be a rescue conducted and no one should try to rescue this guy who fell into crevasse because they are prepared to do it. Of course, whenever you go to uh, conduct research on the glacier, you take your equipment, a harness, crampons, uh, axe, ice axes, uh, ropes, just to pull yourself up. But sometimes it is problematic because once you fall into the, into the crevasse, you melt your surroundings, uh, the, the glacier melts, and then it freezes again, and just you, you get stuck into that and you cannot move anymore. So someone else has to come down for you and take you out. And this happened a few years ago uh, on Hans Bren uh, near the Polish Polar Station. But whatever we do, we try to be prepared as well as we can. So we always uh, identify the possible risks to avoid the problems. And it always depends on the actions, on the monitoring that we conduct, on the research we want to do. Uh, if there's river on the way to our study site, if there's a glacier on the way, or it's the main point of our uh, measurements, uh, or if we go to some other part of the fjord, there can be shallow water, there can be stronger wind, you know, topogra topographic conditions, topoclimate conditions change within the fjords in different valleys. It can be just different uh, weather. Uh, so we have to be prepared for that. And we just have to think. Uh, and preparation to conduct research in different season is different because you need different equipment, different clothes. Uh, for example, you can have, I I'll show you because I have it in my room, a snowmobile suit.
So this seat is perfect for riding snowmobile, but and for standing once we, for example, drill the boreholes. But if you have to climb a mountain, it will be impossible because you will sweat too much. It will be too warm. So you need multiple layers whenever you have to walk or climb or go further just to be protected from wind, from water and from sweating. So it has to be breathable, windproof and waterproof clothing. And actually there's no one perfect cloth for that. So uh, usually we take multiple layers with us in the backpack just to put on more layers if it's necessary. Uh, whatever we do, we just plan, think and prepare ourselves. Uh, we just think what can go wrong in this case and that case if we go to the glacier what if it will be slippery we need the crampons what if we fall into the crevasse what if it will be wet because uh, melting uh, snow is sometimes can be really wet uh, and you don't want to get whole wet because of that so uh, you need to just be prepared for different situations uh, there is no one perfect clothing, as I said, and what's important is just taking to the field extra mittens, extra uh, gloves, because I, I saw when my colleague was on the top of the mountain, his glove was just taken by the wind, just took it off for a second. And, you know, it's very important to have the spare pair in your backpack, because if you won't find this glove, he actually managed to find it, but uh, without it, he would have to go down the mountain with his hand in his pockets, which is just impossible to go down. So yeah, that's something that you have to have in your mind to be always prepared. Uh, in the steep terrain, there can be some rock falls. So it's important to have uh, special equipment for that and go slowly and inform you need the helmet for example it can be slippery so your shoes have to be uh have to protect your ankles uh yeah so that's preparation for such activities helmets gloves hiking boots these are very necessary uh on the glaciers we use uh, as i mentioned crampons uh ropes and equipment that allows us to go on the glacier safe, safely. Uh, in case of measurements of uh, runoff in different rivers, uh, the water flow in the rivers, uh, in Arctic rivers can uh, vary drastically within hours. Uh, just because when you go to the field in the morning, it's still a lower temperature after the night, but during the day, the melting starts and the level of river can rise very rapidly. And glacial rivers, uh, they transfer lots of sediments. So you cannot see the bottom of the river, as you can see on the picture on the left and on the right. Uh, so it's slippery and it can be also dangerous. And without proper uh, boots, rubber boots, it's not possible to cross the rivers. Uh, we usually uh, use the suits. Uh, one of them I can also show you because I have it here. <laughs> So that's the one that I used in the middle picture, and I always take it with me because it's dry suit that allows me to go on rubber boat and also in the rivers. Uh, there are a few uh, points that I would like to say about the mountain code that applies to the Arctic, but also other places. Always plan your trip and leave the words of your route. At the station, we have a book where everyone writes where, where they are going, when they are coming back, and what's the alarm hour. Alarm hour uh, is the last moment before the uh, you know rescue will be called. If something happens, you need to inform because after this time, uh, everyone knows that something happened to you. Then you have to adapt your route to your ability and the conditions. You don't want to go onto the steepest slopes uh, just because it, you can get stuck there and you may have problems with going up or down. So it's better to choose the easier slope. There is no tourist paths in Svalbard. Uh, so it's not like in the regular mountains in our 
<clears throat> zone, like in Tatra Mountains, for example, there are chains on the rocks. If you want to climb the uh, tallest peaks, it it's prepared for those who try to do it. In Svalbard, no, there is no such thing. You just choose uh, the route by your own. Then you have to be weather wise. You check the uh, weather forecast and also avalanche forecast just to know what can happen uh, in the field. Yeah. Weather can change very rapidly, so you prepare yourself for worse conditions that you can see. Uh, then you can see on the weather forecast. Uh, even on short trips, you may think that yeah, it's sunny, it's perfect. I go just for two kilometers one way, so maybe I don't need my extra jacket. But then after one kilometer, you realize it can be windy. It's different conditions than near the station. So yeah, you have to be prepared every time. Then you need to bring the sufficient equipment to be able to help yourself and others. Just think what you need in the field, for example, uh, the rope on the glacier or uh, the flare gun just to uh, scare away the polar bear. And then always we also take rifles. Polar bears are, are protected since 1973 and uh, whatever you can do to avoid uh, protecting yourself using rifle, you do it. But if there is situation you have to use the rifle, it also have to, has to be prepared. And then uh, you just have to make safe route choices, recognize the terrain and check the weak ice, for example, on the glacier uh, and also on the sea ice and uh, surface uh, ice on the lakes. You need to know your location always. So we use compass or yeah, we use GPSs, but for that you need the batteries that uh, will work in the cold conditions. So you keep the batteries close to your body, not in the external pockets because they will discharge super fast in low temperatures. Then uh, you have to turn back in time uh, just to avoid some uh, dangerous situations. And then you have to just save your strength just to know, because you know, we can go really far, but remember that you have to go back as well. So it's just calculation of your strength that is also necessary. And it, uh, it applies everywhere. Uh, here I show just some of my publications. If you're uh, looking for information, you can type my name and you will find some publications. Also PDF with album Polish Polar Station that is available. Uh, yeah, there are also movies I prepared on YouTube. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm here to, to answer them if I'll be able. Mm -hmm.